This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Arctic freeze continues in Calgary and seems to have affected the Calgary Flames as well. As always, I'm Dan Stevenson alongside Matt DeBorg. And uh, Matt, kind of disappointing week for the Flames this week, isn't it? Well, the offense certainly went cold after being so good for so long. What's colder, the weather outside or the Calgary Flames right now? Well, I have to say the weather because, you know, the Flames did get a point this week. But, yeah, it was not their best effort in either game. Well, let's take a look at these two games, as we always do to start the show. Uh, The Flames had a couple days off. They took Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of last week off, played Thursday at the Dome, and then, and this is a weird thing to say, they took on Vancouver on Saturday to start the longest road trip of the year, which is a four-game road trip. Yeah, I know. It seems abnormally short. Isn't it? Like, it, it takes a week to do four games, which is about right, but it just seems like, wow, if they're only on the road for four, we've seen, like, seven eight game road trips when the briars been here and stuff that's that's i i can i don't mind four games on the road yeah that's not too too bad well, well let's start with the home game here uh calgary lost five to two to the sharks this is a game where riddick was pulled after allowing f- two goals in the first six shots and uh i really don't know what to say here the flames did not look good in this outing well I don't blame the coach for pulling Riddick with the two goals that he gave up. Like, those were just, like, what are you doing level goals. Uh, And, like, frankly, the Flames, up until the point that Kane scored, had pretty much all of the momentum, and those two goals just were a a backbreaker. Yeah, I mean, Jankowski scored early. The team was looking good. Yeah, and then two goals that... Like the first one was really bad, and the second one, he's just not that good with passing the puck. Like he should have dumped it behind the net around to his defender instead of trying to force it. But it is what it is, and you know, uh, I don't blame the coach for pulling him and putting Smith in. You know, you have to try and shake the team up, and unfortunately, a perfect tip right after, you know, just to put salt on the wound like there's there's not a goaltender in the nhl that would have stopped that that third goal no and it wasn't (laughs) just goaltending let's be fair i mean even when smitty came in he didn't look great but the flames were not doing well on their own end it was a lot of the same problems we've talked about all season magnified yeah exactly and san jose to their credit they came to play and every opportunity they had they jumped on it I thought the Flames were the better team overall in the game. And, like, if they had any puck luck in the second period, they could have easily walked away with three or four goals. It's just that none of their goal mouse scrambles ended up going in. And it was just too little too late, and that was it. When I was watching this, I know this might sound weird to some people, I thought Calgary was the better offensive team, but I thought that San Jose played a better complete game. I can agree with that. You know, like I, I wouldn't even say Calgary got better chances, but they were just making more of their offensive zone and their puck possession. They had 57% face-off wins. Um, they had less time in the box. Like They were just playing a better offensive game. But San Jose was able to play better in their own end. They were able to get the puck from us a lot better, and they capitalized. Yeah, and some people point to, oh, San Jose is a bigger team than Calgary, and that's part of the reason why they were able to defend. And honestly, I think if you played that same game the same way ten times, the Flames probably win that game eight or nine of them. It's just that, it, unfortunately, everything just kind of conspired to go wrong for the team at the worst times, and... You have games like that, and it's frustrating, especially because those two points against San Jose were extremely important, and now the Flames are on the verge of losing first place in the West, and if San Jose beats Vancouver when we're recording, 
then we will no longer be in first in the West, although we will have two games in hand. And, like, this was the thing I was worried about. Would the team come out of the break being a little too overconfident on that, oh, well, we got down, oh, well, we can just outscore our problems instead of playing well from the start and we've seen three of the four games now where they've lost just because they weren't able to follow through and do all the right things that they need to do offensively they're still good it's just that there's not a, as much focus on the complete team game that they need we hoped maybe they could right the wrong later in the week when the Flames took on in Vancouver, the Vancouver Canucks, and that was Saturday night for Hockey Night in Canada, and at least the Flames got one point out of this one. They got an overtime loss, a 4-3 loss. Goals for the Flames came from Lindholm, Bennett, and Mangiapane got his first ever NHL goal. Um, I, I think everyone's talking about James Neal spitting chiclets, but is there anything else really to talk about on this one? Well, this was a game where the Flames 99 times out of 100 win this game. And, like, they outshot them, like, I think it was 50 to 24 or something ridiculous like that. And they had so many more offensive scoring chances. Uh, Riddick allowed one particularly bad goal, the Levo, the Levo goal, the second one. But there's just, the Flames seem to lack a little bit of intensity. And that's a little, that was one of the things I was a little concerned about. Was, it, were they going to regress a bit? And right now, it's only four games. They play Tampa tomorrow, which that will not be an easy contest for them. Like, they, they could be going out of the break one and four quite easily and starts to snowball at that point and like i don't i they're not in any danger of missing the playoffs but instead of getting a team like vancouver in round one they'll they could very well be playing vegas and that's a lot more difficult of a challenge and that's before i move away from this game um i want to address what you just said before i move away from this game this game to me reminded me of the last couple times we played the sharks in the play or sorry the ducks in the playoffs the Ducks got physical and took Calgary off their game and were able to win because of it. And that's what I felt in this Canucks game. I felt the Canucks were getting physical. The Canucks were sort of making Calgary get angry and not go out and play our hockey game. Yeah, I can agree with that entirely. As far as what you were saying about us losing, you know, since the break, you and I have said since the beginning of the season, uh, knock on wood, this team has not had a long losing streak. I mean, usually we see a seven-game win streak and a seven-game losing streak every year. I hate to say it, is it just time for the losing streak? Well, it's starting to look like it, and especially with them playing Tampa and Pittsburgh this week, that if they don't change things up pretty damn soon, uh, they could easily be one and six. You know, and, like, that's really horrible, uh, especially because of the fact that they fought so hard to get to where they were and are just letting it slip right through their fingers and they've got enough of a lead where they don't have to worry about making the playoffs but it they're just making their road significantly more difficult just because of them being a little too lackadaisical do you think this team is regressing or do you just think that all the things that have been an issue this season were really seen because they're not scoring as much? I feel like this team has had the same issues we saw in the last two games all season. They haven't been tight enough in their own end. Goaltending's been questionable, but they've sort of been able to outscore their problems and that's why they're number one. And I'm wondering now that maybe the scoring's not coming as easily if the team's regressing or are we just able to see those holes a bit more? Well, it's a little bit of A and it's a little bit of B. And I think that um, the Flames need to... Like, if they can get... Like, that's part of the reason why, like, when we've been talking about, oh, well, we should acquire this guy or that guy at the trade deadline, it's because of these problems we're seeing them. And they are problems. And, like, I like when I was suggesting to acquire a goaltender, it wasn't so much that Mike Smith is terrible because 
frankly, who cares? Like, he's not going to really see any ice in the playoffs or anything like that. The important thing is that what happens if Riddick starts to falter? And he's been playing badly for a while now. And it's been a few weeks now where he's been as bad as Mike Smith's ever been. And, like, the last couple of games, the the losses are his fault because of really bad goals that he gave up. It, you know, call a spade a spade. And, you know, it those are the first couple of times that he's cost us games this season where Smith had, like, six or seven games that he's cost us this year. But, like, that's why, like, we need a goaltender. It, just in case Riddick starts to falter, we have somebody who's actually a goaltender. And to be and fair to right Riddick, now. I mean, look at whoever you think the best goalie in the league is. He's got a couple games that he's cost his team as well. Oh, for sure. It's just that because he's so young and inexperienced, he doesn't have anybody pushing him. Like, Smith is not in danger of retaking the starter's position from him. So, it, it, the, the whole season basically rides on the fact of how good is David Riddick. And it, more recently, he's been not so good. And the Flames, accordingly, are doing bo- very poorly. And if the Flames had a legitimate backup of some kind, then you could have, a, like, say Riddick's struggling the last couple of games. You put the other guy in for three or four games in a row. Let hi- You know, if he's playing well, let him run with it for a bit and let Riddick reset work on things in practice to get back into things instead of just continuing to flounder and that's where i think part of the problem is is that he doesn't have anybody who can legitimately take over the starting job for a few games to allow him to work on things and now the team is struggling because of that and i think that that's why the flames definitely need a goaltender of some kind and it doesn't need to be an all-star guy by any stretch or a starter guy. It just needs to be an NHL caliber goaltender, which we don't currently have as a backup. So, I mean, you and I have talked about it. Going out and trying to acquire a starter at the deadline is not a cost the Flames are going to pay. There's only, let's say, a handful of them available, and they're going to be expensive. Do you have any names of goaltenders you think you'd like to see the Flames acquire and what you think that cost might be? Uh, number one on my target list and i know it's edmonton but it would be cam talbot because talbot has shown like he you have to figure he's playing behind edmonton's defense which like they have basically six dalton prouts on their defense like you know they're a horrible hockey team do you think any go- one more to acquire talbot <laughs> Honestly, I don't think the cost would even be much more than that. Like, I don't think it'd cost more than a third round pick, if that, frankly, to get Talbot. I think they're, they'd be just happy getting something for him at this point, because his stats aren't very good. And when I've watched him play, like, even when he's struggling, it's... Like, if he had competent defenders in front of him, he wouldn't be as exposed. And... Like, when he's good, he's a top-tier goaltender. It's just that he's up and down all the time, but it makes sense because you're playing for Edmonton. So uh, that would be the number one target on my list. There are other guys. There's a whole bunch of them. Like, but... you know, we I was ha- we were having a discussion on Twitter today, a few Flames fans, and names like Jimmy Howard came up. But, th- I mean, that's going to be a significant cost to acquire Howard. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, I, that's going to be a first plus, and that's just ridiculous. And I, I don't, you know, I wouldn't not go after Howard. I just wouldn't go after him at the deadline. I think guys like Howard or uh, Varlamov or Mrazek, Leonard, uh, any of these guys that are you know might be available, they are July first acquisitions when the acquisition cost is nil. Exactly, and you know, like honestly, if you're spending more than a fourth or a fifth, then I think you're putting too much into it. Like, uh, we just need an NHL goaltender, and you know, apologies to Mike Smith, but he is the worst goaltender in the NHL, uh, both starter and backup. So it. We need an NHL goaltender. 
And it doesn't matter who it is. It just need any, literally any other goaltender would be a major improvement. And we need that. It, it's foundational to the rest of the season. Like the Flames season could get pissed away just because of loyalty to Mike Smith. And it'd be one thing if we had a prospect who was champing at the bit, like Carter Hart in Philadelphia, where okay, throw him in there for a few games and see what he has. Both Parsons and Gillies have looked kind of iffy for most of the year. We need somebody. Any other goalie you say, Brian Elliott may be available. I would not touch that with a 10-foot so pole. Anybody but Brian Elliott. Pretty um, much. I, I know I've I, said this uh, to you before. I think the acquisition costs might be cheap. Not looking at him as a guy to be the starter for the playoffs, but to be that sort of solid backup who's been there. What would you think if the Flames went out to Chicago and got Cam Ward? Uh, it wouldn't be that much of an upgrade on Smith, frankly. Like if, if I wouldn't want to sign him long term, but rental it might not be a bad idea. Run a three headed goaltending system. Yeah, like if the cost was basically a seventh round pick, then sure, I guess. But beyond that. You know, I wouldn't bother. I'd find there's got to be some better options in Ward. He's been kind of as bad as Smith this year. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think you're going to find anybody much better. You could try to get Anders Nilsson out of Ottawa. That might be your only other better option. Yeah, there are a few. It's just like I think anything in the neighborhood of a third round pick should be available for a goalie of some sort. It's just who and what, basically. And you were talking earlier about, you know, Riddick's inexperience. And let me just go through his NHL stats here. He's played 55 total NHL games, started 46 games, won 28, lost 10, and eight overtime losses. Um, which, I mean, if you think about 55 total games, we really don't have the book on this guy. And as I said to you earlier in the season, Matt, I think he's looked good because he's behind Calgary's defense. I don't think he needs to be a star. We don't need Kippersoft no. behind this defense. He's looked good enough, and we've hidden some of his flaws because of Calgary's defense. But yeah, you're... like at the most, I think he's a middle-of-the-pack starter in the NHL, if not slightly below average in terms of his just raw talent. I don't think you go into next season saying we've got our starter. I think you're no. still going out looking for another guy. I agree wholeheartedly. And you know, it's not it, like when Kipper was here and we said we got our starter. Who who can we fill in behind him that nobody knows? Yeah. Well, like that's part of the reason why I'm not opposed to getting Cam Talbot, uh, just because that would be one of the targets I'd be going for in the off season. I think t the price for Talbot, just because he is going to be available, and I think other teams want goaltending, I think the price of the deadline would be out of the Flames' reach. I know. And, you know, like if he goes for a second or something stupid like that, then, yeah, have fun with I, whomever. I have but... no problem going after him July 1st. I just don't think the price is going to be worth it at the deadline. I think he'll be one yeah. of the few goalies to move. Yeah. I don't know exactly. You know, like even if it was Ryan Miller, I'd be fine with that. You know, like, there's a handful of guys out there where it, they just need somebody. They need a born body, basically, that can spell Riddick when he's struggling like he is now. And you can put him in for three or four games instead of running out the goalie that's struggling and losing game after game after game until he figures it out. And, like, it's not fair to Riddick and it's not fair to the team to put the season basically in jeopardy because of it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think if the Flames want to get a decent goaltender, that might be that might take pretty much all their assets for the deadline. Like I don't think you go out and get, you know, a serviceable goaltender and do something else. I think if they're gonna get somebody decent, that's gonna cost everything they've got to trade. It depends on who and what. Like honestly, I don't see any of the goaltenders costing more than a third round pick. Like and frankly, there are a few that you could probably get for a sixth that would be fine. You know, like, the Flames' defense is pretty good. And, like, even if the guy has okay stats, put him behind the Flames' defense versus whatever mediocre team that they're playing for, and they will magically be better. It's just, they need somebody. And it's one of those where it's not a... I'd like to have it's a 
I need it right now kind of problem. Yeah, at this point, it's going to be a rental, though. Oh, yeah, for sure. And you reevaluate in the off season and see what's available UFA. Well, you also got to figure out how much money you need to keep Chucky here. I think that's more than yeah. anything the first thing they've got to do. Yeah. And, you know, just saying this now, if Kachuk is not playing in to start the year, you can basically write him off as a player that will be a contributor to the team for next season. <laughs> well, Just because it... you look at Nylander in Toronto, like he's been hot garbage this year. And he'll bounce back next year. It's just that it never works whenever a player comes back like halfway through the year. I don't think you'll miss time, but if you remember even uh, Johnny, they didn't get the deal done until like the opening night of the season or the opening night of training camp or something. I, no, he missed camp. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happened with Chucky. Yeah. Um, and I, I think a seven, seven and a half million, seven year, seven and a half would be about right for him, but... Somebody asked me if he'd get offer sheeted, and I think you know what? If you want to pay eight million and give us five first rounders, you can have them. Uh, it it wouldn't be that. It'd be like a first and like a third at is eight it, million. Is that all it is now? Yeah, it. You have to go up to like eleven million, I think, for uh, four firsts now. Oh wow! Okay, they must change yeah. that because last time yeah. I looked, it we'll was put like... it this way: if somebody's offer sheets them signing like a seven like eight and a half million yeah, you dollar contract that. you just match it and you go well you're a dick to them for signing it and you carry on with your day and you know that's about it like and, and you'd probably ruin the relationship between the player and the team and probably it would result in him eventually getting traded but you know that's another story for another day so after this rough week for the Flames, they now have 55 games played, uh, 34 wins, 15 losses, 6 overtime losses for 74 points, still sitting at the top of the West. Tampa Bay, the only team above us, has 86 points. And San Jose nipping right at our heels with 73. I hate to say it, Matt, I think San Jose's going to overtake us in the next week here. Well, they're only three minutes into the game against Vancouver, and they're already up to nothing. So, yeah, they're going to overtake us tonight. And I don't so. think this is going to be something where they overtake us and next game we get it back. I think they're probably going to take the number one spot for a week or two in Calgary's. And maybe that's what they need. Maybe they need the motivation to fight back. Yeah. Well, they need a, a kick in the pants, frankly. And, like, you know, the their play for the last four games has frankly been unacceptable. And for a team that's a serious team, to be a contender for the division, the conference, all that. And, you know, like it, now they're going to be lining up. Like, if things go as they have been, then you're lining up to play Vegas in round one. And that's a lot more difficult than either, like, a team like Minnesota or Vancouver or Colorado or Chicago. Like, they're just making their lives a lot more difficult by playing like this but you know we're talking about a two-game losing streak like you know there's two games is nothing in the grand scheme of 82 of them it's because i think they didn't look great in those two but you know our worst losing streak this year was three games in a row like two games in the grand scheme of things is not that bad no but now if we drop tampa bay and we drop florida and we drop pittsburgh now we got something to talk about yeah, uh, it's just that they need to hold themselves to a higher standard. And it'd be one thing like if last year didn't happen, but last year they were the single worst team in the NHL after their break. And now they've won one out of four. It's a little worrying because last year they fell off a cliff and were hot garbage for the the they were a playoff team heading into the all-star break last year and then they completely imploded on themselves and i you know it's a little worrying when you're seeing the exact same story coming out it through the first four games of oh well they're playing like hot garbage again and yeah, like, I, I think part of it, too, is they've played four games in 11 days. Like This team is used to being busy this year, and we get back to three weeks of three, ga three games a week. I wonder if this team just needs to be busy to 
to keep going. Like, I wonder if they're getting a bit, a little bit lazy sitting at home. Oh, I agree. And like that it could very well be why they're struggling. It's just that they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot. And, you know, you, you hate to see such a good start to a year get flushed down the toilet just because they had a little bit of time off. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not ready to say it's that bad yet. I want to see how they make it through the rest of this road trip. I mean, like I said, oh, I two, agree. it's two games. Like, and, I agree. And you know what the likelihood is if we look at this is, I mean, we played, what, four games so far this month. So look at a seven-game playoff series. You're probably going to lose two. It's likely you might even lose two in a row. It's about how you back back come back from that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they have a tough little stretch here they have to show some intestinal fortitude they need to go out to tampa and beat them and tampa's lost a couple games recently there's no reason they're not unbeatable they looked horrible against florida the other day they won five to two but the second period like florida like if florida was actually a decent hockey team like they skunk tampa in that game like that's how bad tampa was in that one so it, it, it's one of those situations where calgary can beat the lightning it's just they have to follow up and actually do it and then not take florida lightly and then not take pittsburgh lightly after that because like i just don't want to see the team like after going doing so well off the hop to get in their own way to the extent where like they have to go through the difficult road in the playoffs yeah no i totally agree with you i just don't think we can sound alarm bells after two losses no it, it's just worrying you know it how would you say to use a star trek term yellow alert not red alert <laughs> you know just keep it you know keep your eyes on it but you know there is danger afoot but, you know, they can easily turn it around. Well, before you give us too many Star Trek references, let's move on to some fan questions from this week. <laughs> yep. um, a lot of people on Twitter asking about James Neal losing his teeth. I'm not quite sure they want us to say. Yes, we all saw him spitting chiclets. Um, he was off the ice for practice today. He was at the dentist getting those repaired. So I know that uh, Keith Kachuk had some nasty stuff in his career where he lost his teeth and then he got them repaired and then he got them snapped again. He actually had to get a bone replaced in his mouth where they had to take it out of his hip to put it in his mouth. So a lot of guys actually aren't getting their teeth repaired because of that until they uh, retire, they're just getting false teeth put in. Yeah, and that makes sense because... You could just paint white on your mouth guard and leave that in for the game. Yeah, like it's not that big of a deal. And, you know, like that... Like, actually, like, my father, he actually had that particular surgery himself, so, um, yeah, and, like, I don't see the need for that, like, if you're continuing to play, because all you need is one more errant high stick, and then, oh, gotta do it again, and... Yeah, it's not worth it. But, you know, good for Neil for coming back in that game. Like, he was pretty much, you know, back on the bench right away. Um, you obviously need to get that checked out by a dentist, but, yeah, I'm not sure what else we can say about him spitting chiclets in that one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's it, this seems to be the, the story of Neil's season. Like, he gets going, and then something bad happens to him. And it's like, you know, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. I know you start to feel bad for the guy like you know and he he has been playing well lately and he's contributing at about his career normal pace for like the last 16 games I think he's at eight points in his last 16 so that that's about right for him it's just that you know like you, you don't like seeing bad things like that happen to him when he's finally starting to get going yeah, no, Matt, I totally agree with you. He's getting going, and he's, you know, pushing forward. But then you get something like this where he loses his teeth, and you hope it just, like, those are the kind of things that mentally take a toll on you. And you hope he can just be the veteran and power through that. Yeah. And hopefully the guys don't bug him too much. <laughs> you know, I think whoever bugs you, you can probably point back at them and point to their holes, too. Like, we even see Hamannick has got some pretty big holes in his mouth i think in today's nhl most guys do yeah and if not you just look at them and say we're waiting for you kid yeah exactly (laughs) 
Uh, we got an email this week from somebody named Alejandro. And Alejandro's email says, First, I love the podcast. Great coverage and insights. I have a question that I would love to hear your thoughts. I'm kind of new to hockey since it was hard to follow until I moved to Canada. I keep hearing you guys talk about how important it is to have a veteran in the team for the playoffs or someone with playoff experience. Why is that? I feel like the team has great chemistry. The players know what to do and have been playing well together all season so far. Why does previous playoff experience matter? Shouldn't Bill Peters or the team approach the games like, guys, it is like any other game. We've played 82 so far. Go out and do what we've been doing. Treat it like any other game, basically. Or am I on crack when I think about this? I know about the pressure and all that, but basically it's another game, is it not? Sorry for the long email, and thanks for making my week with your podcast. So Alejandro, we're glad you emailed us. Good question. Uh, Matt, let's get your thoughts first. Why is playoff experience so important, especially as we're moving towards the deadline? Uh, there's two different animals. The regular season hockey is just a grind that you get through to for playoff seeding. And then you start to go to war. And game one of the quarterfinals is when the real hockey season starts. And it's not the same thing. And like you would think it is, but like the intensity in a normal regular season is about one maybe two out of ten and maybe if the you have two rival teams like with some animosity it might get up to like four out of ten most playoff games are like a nine at the minimum and unless you have two teams that aren't gonna go anywhere facing off then it's not that you know there are some pedestrian playoff series but those teams tend to lose one in the first, one in the second, and that's it. But, you know, it it's a whole different animal. And it's hard for a bunch of young players who are just used to regular season hockey or their only playoff experience might be the games against Anaheim, the four-game sweep from a, year, a couple years ago, where it's not the same thing. And it takes a lot of different plays and understanding of how playoff hockey is to be successful and very rarely do you see a team that doesn't have playoff experience just go all the way and win the cup like it just doesn't happen and like even Chicago who went on to win three cups in a row they lost it the first time they made the playoffs and I think they lost the second time too before getting going and they started to get the experience because they had the talent to actually make some deep runs but Calgary has only made it to the second round once since 2004 where they lost in five games and then the other time with this group they lost in four so there's not a ton of experience with most of the players on the team so getting a guy or two that has been through playoff series and all that they can just be a sounding board to go okay i'm in this situation what do i do and it, it's one of those it's not something that stands out on the ice it's more of a in your head type of thing and you you just need to like until you actually go through it you don't know what it's like and having some people there that have been through that it makes life a lot easier and Alejandro your email talks about the chemistry of this team and how these guys have been playing well together so far I don't think you go out and see the flames change the chemistry of this team we're not going to see a core guy moved out for playoff experience it's as we were talking about last week guys who you know, would come cheap and be an addition to this team. So it's not really going to change a lot of the core here. Um, you know, you can always do with an extra veteran here or there. And I think that's really the big thing is if the team were to go out and move, say, a veteran piece like a Bennett or, you know, even a Froelich or Backland uh, for a veteran piece of playoff experience, yeah, I can see there being an issue. But I think what Matt and I are talking about is just bringing in that guy who, like Matt said, knows what they're doing, has been there, can help the team, and – still can be an NHL veteran if we need someone in for one or two games. They've been to the playoffs, they know what's going on, and you often feel better putting that guy in than, say, calling up Dubé or Phillips or something like that. It's just, you know, a guy who's been there, done that, 
and has some idea of what the mindset's going to be of a playoff game. Well, like if you look back to 04, uh, the Flames acquired Marcus Nilsson, Ville Neiman, and, and Chris Simon uh, at that deadline. And none of those players are or were particularly good. They were just all depth pieces. But Chris Simon had went to the Stanley Cup Finals with Washington, I do believe, uh, 97-98. And uh, Billy Niemann went to the finals, I do believe, in 0102. And so, like, they had playoff experience. And Nilsson was just a very good, responsible defensive player. And But all three of those guys were just depth filler parts. And, like, none of them, I think, were expensive. I think Nilsson was a second round pick, and uh, Niemann was some minor guy i think it was even jason morgan i'm not sure but and uh McElhenney for simon so you know like it wasn't they weren't going out and getting key offensive guys to help them through it was just rounding out the team a bit and i think that's what the flames also need to do this time is just add a couple of various parts that add a little bit of experience because the flames frankly were in the same spot last time in 04 where they had no experience like again had never been to the playoffs at that point other than his rookie debut against chicago in 95 96 and it was the same kind of thing where they just needed some guys who had been there a bit even just to chime in uh, when things got tough and this team doesn't, other than James Neal, they don't really have any of that. And so that's why just having a couple extra voices in the room wouldn't hurt. Well, especially on the Ford ranks. I mean, if you look at sort of the guys who are homegrown and have come through the Calgary ranks, Goudreau, Monaghan, both come through Calgary. Their only playoff experience is what we've given them. Lindholm comes from Carolina, not a ton of experience. Kachuk, Backlund, again, Flames. So really you've got Froelich and Neal who have any sort of playoff experience in the forward depth. Yeah, because Bennett and Jankowski, they've just been here. Yeah, Mangiapani's fresh, new to the NHL, so is that new NHL player smell. Ryan's yeah, been Hathaway. Journeyman. Yeah, Ryan hasn't, I don't think, has ever been I don't to the think playoffs. So. So, and then know, on the back end, uh, again, we've got Hannafin and Hamannick, who are really the only non-Calgary guys. Yeah, and each uh, Hannafin's never been to the playoffs, and Hamannick a couple of times, but the Islanders suck. So it's not like they ever went anywhere. So I think for sure, if we were talking about, you know, changing our core to bring in playoff guys, I'd be worried like Alejandro is. But I think bringing in a couple extra depth guys and the roster limit gets lifted after the trade deadline. Remember that we can keep as many guys in the roster as we want to. So having a couple older guys kicking around, it's it's almost like an insurance policy. Yeah. And like you, you're seeing that with, uh, the uh predators going out and getting brian boyle and cody mcleod neither one of those guys is awesome you know like boyle's a decent physical player but mcleod is just there he's a a fighter but they both have a lot of playoff experience so it's one of those things that they're filling out the bottom part of their roster with some guys just to add a little bit more to their team and it helps I wouldn't have paid what was paid for Boyle, but I think if we could get a guy like Boyle to be that, you know, twelfth, thirteenth forward, I feel more comfortable in a pinch putting him into a Flames jersey in the playoffs than, you know, bringing up a Spencer Fu or Dylan Dubé. Like that's really what you're going for this time of year. Is that if we get into a jam and in the playoffs, remember you're playing so often that guys are getting banged up. Who would you rather put in that guy with some playoff experience or Spencer Fu? Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. As much as we might like Spencer Fu, who think he's, you know, the next coming of Wayne Gretzky or whatever you might think of him, he's an inexperienced rookie AHL player. Like I would well, rather you could even say that doing. frankly with every single guy on Stockton practically. Like you wouldn't sure. want really any of them playing unless absolutely necessary. And that's why you bring in some proven NHLers. Yep. And you got to remember, those kind of guys are all rentals. Like, you're not bringing in a guy with a three, four year deal. You're bringing in a bunch of guys who can get us through these playoffs, and then you reassess in the offseason if you want to keep them around or not. 
Exactly. And if they're, they prove to be a decent piece that you can keep, then you re-sign them for not very much money. Like, league minimum-ish. Because that's the, more of the type of guy that you're looking at. You're not for what we're talking about for that. Like, if you go out and get a, a top six forward like a Nyquist, then, hey, awesome. But, you know, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And the last question we got, or, yeah, I guess the last hockey question we got this week was uh, from Jonathan Nimmo at JD Nimmo 12 on Twitter. He asked us, for the right price, would you want to reacquire Furland? I've just watched highlights of him in the playoffs and am now torn. Think he'd be too expensive, but would add something. So I guess, you know, Jonathan, you're saying, would you acquire him from the right price? My question would be, what do you think that right price is? I think Furland's going to be expensive. I think there's going to be other teams looking at him. Um, I I like the idea of him coming back, but I'm not sure he's a guy I'd want to spend assets on at the deadline. I think it'd be worth the Flames talking to him July 1st. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, uh, I think that some team is going to give a first-round pick for Furland. Plus, frankly. And, like, to me, that just doesn't make any sense at all. An and interesting story came out this week. Did you hear the Ryan Reeves story? Uh, no. So the Calgary Flames apparently thought they had Ryan Reeves wrapped up for a contract. That's why they traded away Furland. And then Ryan Reeves last minute decided to go back to Vegas. So they thought, we're getting rid of some muscle and bringing in some muscle. Um, and, yeah, the Reeves thing never happened. So... I think you're you're right. I mean, we definitely gave away a piece that we needed to give away to get what we got. But I think if if you look back at he's saying he watched highlights of Furland in the playoffs. Furland was the sandpaper guy. That's why we all fell in love with him. And I think you've got guys like Hathaway who could fill that role this year. I'm not sure it's worth the first plus, and I agree that's what he's going to get to bring Furland in. Yeah, and frankly, like if you're going to spend that level of asset. Like, I'm all for trading the first-round pick this year because it's going to be a late first. Who cares? I want a better player than Michael Furland. And I like Furland. Like, don't, you know, a guy said, like, I don't want him back, but it's not because I don't like him. I want him on the team. It's just that, realistically, both what he's going to get for a contract and what he's going to cost to get back is just going to be too high. And it just doesn't make any financial sense to do so. Or, or you know, asset management-wise, it just doesn't make any sense. And it's frustrating because I do like him. And it's just that with his injury history and everything, I just don't see it being a good idea. And well, that's I think my like, worry. For the money he would get, I think you'd end up being like Boma, where he's not going to live up to that money and you'll probably end up buying it out because of his injury history. Yeah, and like frankly, if you're gonna go that route, why not go for a guy like Stone or Simmons or a handful of other guys that like Hayes? If the first rounder is gonna be in play, I expect it to be a bigger deal than Michael Furland. Yeah, like I'd be like if our first is gone and we only get Furland out of it, I'm gonna be disappointed. Me too. And you know, like because that'd be like okay, well, why? Uh, you know, why couldn't you get got somebody better? I'll be disappointed if the first goes for any rental. Like, if the first is going, I'd like it to be for a longer-term piece. Oh, I agree. Same here. And I'd like it to be for someone that you can realistically sign for five, six, seven years, if possible. But, you know, it just depends on who and what. But yeah, you're right. There's so many other pieces out there that we could get for that first. Even last week, we talked about, you know, Zuccarello. I'd rather get him for the first. Like, I, we like Furland, and we, we've we talked about this in the show before. We always like the tough guys. We all like McGratton. You know, you talked about Simon, Oliwa. Like, we tend to like the tough guys. I remember when we all loved Rocky Thompson back in the day, terrible hockey player, tough as nails. And Furland was the tough guy for us. And I, I just think that if we want to go out and get muscle, or get big, we can get that for a lot cheaper. Yeah, I agree. And, like, I'd be fine with Kreider or, you know, like, there's a whole bunch of guys, mm -hmm. frankly, uh, that would be perfectly fine and would contribute basically the same level of ability as Furland, if not better in terms of raw talent. It's just, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, uh, 
it's frustrating because you know like would furland help this team sure definitely yeah but would furland help yes but will he help at deadline prices i don't think so no you know where yeah i i think he's gone we're we're sad he's gone but sons you've got to give to get and i'm okay saying goodbye to furland knowing that we got lindholm out of it and hannafin because frankly hannafin's better than hamilton so yeah, I, I kind of look at it still. Uh, I take Fox out when I think about it in my mind. I think it's kind of Furland for Lindholm, uh, Hamilton for Hannafin. Yeah, and I think we got the better end of both. And if Fox stays with Carolina, and tur- he'd have to basically turn into a superstar to equalize things out. Well, the last question we got for the week was from the... Uh, our friend over at the Clarinet podcast, they talk about clarinets, and we asked, what do you want to talk about? And he said, clarinets. So, Matt, I don't know anything about clarinets. Anything you want to say about clarinets? Not particularly. I don't have any experience with one. Um, I've seen somebody play one. I've heard the sounds a clarinet makes. That's about all my experience. Yeah. Going back to Star Trek, I know one of the characters on Star Trek Voyager played one. That's about it. <laughs> You know, and yes, I am a Star Trek nerd, so bite me. <laughs> so I guess the only thing I could say is if we were going to compare a Flames player to a clarinet, I think it'd be Mark Jankowski because he's kind of long and narrow like a clarinet. Okay, and we need to get off this page. Well, we've talked about clarinets. We promised we would, so uh, thanks for sending there that in, go. Clarinet. <laughs> and if you're a clarinet person, you can listen to the Clarinet podcast at clarinet.com. So, uh, the host is a friend of mine, so I wanted to plug his show since he asked us a question. Well, Matt, that brings us to our weekly predictions, and the Flames finally have some more hockey to play this week. Um, looking at the schedule, the Flames out of practice today. Tomorrow there's 11 a.m. skate and then a 7.30 game in Tampa Bay. Uh, then the 13th is a day off. They're, I would imagine, traveling to Florida that day, 11.30 a.m. skate on Thursday with a 7 p.m. Uh, game at the BB&T Center, which is the Panthers Arena. Uh, the next day is a 1 p.m. and they're leaving Florida, it looks like, right after that game. 1 p.m. practice on Friday at the uh, UPMC Sports Complex, and then Pittsburgh on Saturday is a 1 p.m. game, and that's 11 a.m. Calgary time. So 1 p.m. Pittsburgh, 11 a.m. Calgary. We've had so many of these matinee games lately. Oh, I know. It's just ridiculous. I used, you know, we used to only get like two a year, three a year. And it seems like we've played like a dozen now. And it just, it's like, go away. The Flames (laughs) will leave Pittsburgh right after that game. On Sunday, they have an 11 a.m. practice at the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. And then back home to take on Arizona on family day monday and that is an early start that's a 2 p.m start so with that three road games tampa bay florida pittsburgh and then we come back on monday to play arizona four games seems more like a regular week for the flames um i've already locked in my predictions you and i both lost last week thinking this team could actually win some hockey games or at least one hockey game um excuse, excuse me my prediction for the week i think we're gonna win against florida and pittsburgh and lose tampa bay and arizona so i think we split the week I'm going to be a little bleaker than you and say that they lose the rest of the road trip and beat Arizona. So, yeah, you know, easily sweep the week, you know, if they actually play well. But, you know, uh, the goaltending is too much of a question mark at this point, And everything, frankly, is too much of a question mark. And until they get their details sorted out... Um, play their game their way uh, i'm not very confident they're gonna win too much for a bit if they win only one game this week i hope it's the pittsburgh game because last time we played pittsburgh here at the dome they beat us 9-1 that was the big spanking of the year so i'm hoping the flames can sort of avenge that loss and go and beat pittsburgh yeah same here but knowing us we'll probably do the same (laughs) or something equally bad just because I mean, right now, last time we played Tempa, they beat us. We got one point out of it. Um, We want to win that, I think, just as fans because it's Tempa Bay and they're the only team above us. The Florida game and Arizona game really only serve, I mean, they're, you know, really only serve to pad out our points. But I think the Flames are still going to struggle through this road trip. I think they can win a couple. I think they can even win all four, but I don't think they're going to be big wins like we've seen. I think they're going to be scraping for points this week. 
Yeah, I agree. And, like, frankly, uh, through the rest of the month, like, they don't, the only, uh, like, beyond the Tampa and Pittsburgh game, only uh, two games against the Islanders are against teams that are actually good. Uh, we play Arizona, Anaheim, Ottawa, New Jersey. Besides that, like, it's, like, the, those teams suck. It, so, like, the Flames, like, if they can... If they're going to find their way, this is the portion of the schedule to find their way in. Yeah, like, if... Because three of their next five games are against very good teams. They need at least two wins, three wins out of the five games. And then after that, they play a bunch of mediocre teams with a couple of decent ones sprinkled in. So, you know, like even into March, like they only play Tampa and Vegas twice, or Toronto and Vegas twice, and Columbus once, and Winnipeg once, and San Jose once, and like all of the rest of the games are against mediocre or bad teams. So, like, it, they can have a pretty good chance of finishing the season strong, it's just they have to get through these tough games and actually get points in them. And with how they're playing, that might be a little more difficult than we would like. <laughs> you know, to be a, to go deep in the playoffs, you have to be able to face adversity. And this, to me, is really the first time as Flames fans we're talking about adversity. I mean, yeah, we've lost some games here and there, but... This is the first time hearing from the fan base, the sky is falling, and I think this really shows, can this team face adversity? Oh, for sure, and they need to get a killer instinct, and that's one of the things that the team has lacked for a long time, is being able to put teams that are bad away, and like we saw that in Carolina when we beat them, but then against Vancouver, they should have won that game handily, based on both the amount of shots and the amount of chances they had, and yet they didn't get two points. And they need to start actually putting the bad teams away and getting the odd game against the good ones, too. And I'm kind of happy that Tampa Bay is our next game because I think that might be enough to get this team going for. I think if it was like Florida and Arizona next, we'd see the slump continue. But I think if these guys are going to get up for some, it's going to be to beat... Uh the best to beat the to beat the best and i think again that pittsburgh game they've got something to prove so i think this is a road trip where they've got something to prove in two of the three games yeah and hopefully they don't sleepwalk against florida so you know which that could happen you know what though if i have to give up a game that's the one i'm willing to give up oh for sure it's just that they need to get their habits going well again so that way they can be good and progress towards being the best team in the west and like they will have you know san jose is going to pass us tonight they're up three nothing now after one uh, vancouver is not coming back from that so but we'll have two games in hand on them so they need to get some points to move past them again and push i forward. can see the flames putting smitty in for the florida game and that's why i think you might see them uh not play as well in that one I could agree with that. I'm kind of expecting that. I think you might see him in Florida. You might see him against uh, the Ducks next week. Yeah, that would make some sense. The Ducks have no coach, so, you know, they're kind of in shambles right now. Like, I, th I think, like you said, they've got to keep kind of riding Smitty when they can to see if they can either get him out of this or decide it's time to pull the trigger on something new. Yeah, and I think either way they have to pull a trigger on something new. Like, they, you can't go into the playoffs with Smith as your backup. Because, like, we're basically gambling the entire season in the playoffs on Riddick being able to handle the pressure when last year he was under pressure and crumbled. So, it's like, do you really want to gamble with that? And I don't see that being a good idea. We're two weeks till the trade deadlines. So we'll see if the Flames end up doing something during this road trip before they come home. I'd really like to see Cam Talbot in the Flames jersey. So We'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, Matt, let's see what happens with that if they make a trade before they get back here to play Arizona. Otherwise, enjoy this road trip. Hopefully they can squeak out a couple wins, and we'll talk to you next week. As always, go Flames, go. Thanks for listening, everyone. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license.
For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.